I exist for those for whom I exist. Anastasia. Chapter 1, The Ringing Cedar. In the spring of 1994, I chartered three river boats on which I carried out a three-month expedition on the River Ob to Siberia from Novosibirsk to Selksharg and back. The aim of the expedition was to foster economic ties with the regions of the Russian Far North. The expedition went under the name of the Merchant Convoy. The largest of the three river boats was a passenger ship named the Patrice Lumumba. Western Siberian river boats bear rather interesting names. The Maria Alnava, the Patrice Lumumbai, the Michael Kalimi, as, as if there were no other personage in history worth commemorating. The lead ship Patrice Lumumbai housed the expedition headquarters, along with a store where local Siberian entrepreneurs could exhibit their wares. The plan was for the convoy to travel north 3,500 kilometers, visiting not only major ports of call such as Tomsk, Nishemvorsk, Kanti Matsyaks, and Sakhard, but smaller places as well where goods could be unloaded only during a brief summer navigation um, season. The convoy would dock at a popular, populated settlement during the daytime. We would offer the wares we had bought, brought for sale and hold talks about setting up regular economic links. Our traveling was usually done at night. If weather conditions were unfavorable for navigation, the lead ship would put into the nearest port and would organize onboard parties for the local young people. Most places offered little in the way of their own entertainment. Clubs and community centers, so-called House of Cultures, have been going downhill ever since the collapse of the USSR, and there were almost no culture activities available. Sometimes we might go for 24 hours or more without seeing a single populated place. Even the tiniest villages, village, from the river, the only transportation artery for many kilom kilom kilometers around, the only thing visible to the eye was the taiga itself. I was not yet aware at the time that somewhere amidst the un inhabited vastness of forests along the river bank, a surprise meeting was awaiting me, one that was to change my whole life. One day on our way back to Norversburg, I arranged to dock the lead ship at a small village, one with only a few houses at best, some 30 or 40 kilometers distance distant from the largest, larger population centers. I planned a three hour stopover so the crew could have shore leave and the local residents could buy some of our goods and food stops. And we could cheaply pick up from them fish and wild growing plants of the taiga. Of the taiga. During our stopover time as the leader of the expedition I was approached by two of the local senior citizens. As I judge at the time, one of them appeared to be somewhat older than the other. The elder of the two, a wise fellow, a wise fellow with a long gray beard, kept silent the whole time, leaving his younger companion to do the talking. This fellow tried to persuade me to lend him 50 of my crews, which numbered no more than 65 in total, to go with them into the taiga, about 25 kilometers or so from the dock where the ship was berthed. 
they would be taking into the depths of the taiga to cut down a tree he described as a ringing cedar. The cedar, which he said reached 40 meters in height, needed to be cut up into pieces, which could be carried by hand to the ship. We must, he said, definitely take the whole lot. The old fellow further recommended that each piece be cut up into smaller pieces. Each of us should keep one for himself and give the rest to relatives, friends, and anyone who wished to accept a piece as a gift. He said this was a most unusual cedar. The piece should be worn on one's chest as a pendant. Hang it around your neck while standing barefoot in the grass, and then press it to your chest with the palm of your left hand. It takes only a moment to feel the pleasing warmth emanating from the piece of cedar, followed by a light tingling sensation running through the whole body. From time to time, whenever desired, the side of the pendant facing away from the body should be rubbed with one's finger, the thumb pressed against the other side. The old fella confidently assured me that within three months, the possessor of one of these ringing cedar pendants, pendants will feel significant, significant improvement in his sense of well-being and will be cured of many diseases, even AIDS. <clears throat> even AIDS, I asked, even AIDS, I asked, and briefly explained what I had learned from this disease from the press. The oldest confidently replied, from any and all diseases. But this, he considered, was an easy task. The main benefit was that anyone having one of these pendants would become kinder, more successful, and more talented. I did know a little about the healing properties of the cedars of our Siberian taiga, taiga, but the suggestion that it could affect one's feelings and abilities, well, to me seemed beyond the bonds of probability. The thought came to me that maybe these old men wanted money from me for this unusual cedar, as they themselves called it. And I began explaining that out in the big wide world, women were used to wearing jewelry made of gold and silver and wouldn't pay a dime for some scrap of wood. And so I wasn't going to lay out any money for anything like that. They don't know what they're wearing, came the reply. Gold, well, that's dust in comparison with one of piece of the cedar, with one piece of the cedar. But we don't need any money for it. We can give you some dry mushrooms in addition, but there's nothing we need from you. Not wanting to start an argument, out of respect for their age, I said, well, maybe someone will wear some of your cedar pendants. They certainly would if a top wood carving craftsman agreed to put his hand to it and create something of amazing beauty. To which the old fellow replied, yes, you could carve it, but it would be better to polish it by rubbing. It will be a lot better if you do this yourself with your fingers whenever your heart desires then the cedar will also have a beautiful look to it. Then the younger of the two quickly unbuttoned first his old worn jacket and then his shirt and revealed what he was wearing on his chest. I looked and saw a puffed out circle or oval. It was multicolored, purple, raspberry, auburn, forming some kind of puzzling design. The vein lines on the wood looks like little streams. I am not a connoisseur of Ojet Dot, although from time to time I have had occasion to visit picture galleries. The world's great masters had not called forth any particular emotions in me, but the objects, but the object hanging around this man's neck aroused significantly greater feelings and emotion than any of my visits to the textbook gallery.
How many years have you been rubbing this piece of cedar, I asked. Ninety-three, the old fellow responded. And how old are you? A hundred and nineteen. At the time, I didn't believe him. He looked like a man of seventy-five. Either he hadn't noticed my doubts, or if he had, he paid no attention to them. In somewhat excited tone, he started he started in trying to persuade me that any piece of this cedar, polished by human fingers alone, would also look beautiful in just three years. Then it would start looking even better and better, especially when worn by a woman. The body of its wearer would give off a pleasant and beneficial aroma, quite unlike anything artificially produced by men. Indeed, a very pleasant fragrance was emanating from both these old men. I could feel it, even though I'm a smoker, and unlike all smokers, have a dull sense of smell. And there was one other peculiarity. I suddenly became aware of phrases in the speech of these strangers that were not common to the resident of this isolated part of the North. Some of them I remember to this day, even the intonation to associate with them. Here was the, what the old fellow told me. God created the cedar to store cosmic energy. When someone is in a state of love, they emit a radiant energy. It takes but a second for it to reflect off the celestial bodies floating overhead and come back to earth and give life to everything that breathes. The sun is one of those celestial bodies and it reflects but a tiny fraction of such radiance. Only bright rays can travel into space from man on the earth and only beneficial rays can be reflected from space back to earth. Under the influence of malicious feelings, man can emit only dark rays. These dark rays cannot rise, but must fall into the depths of the earth. Bouncing off its core, they return to the surface in the form of volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, wars, and etc. The culminating achievement of these dark rays is their direct effect on the man originating them invariably exacerbating this man's own malicious feelings. Cedars live to be 550 years old. Day and night, their millions of needles catch and store the whole spectrum of bright energy. During the period of the cedars' life, all the celestial bodies pass above them, reflecting this bright energy. Even in one tiny piece of cedar, there is more energy beneficial to men than in all the man-made energy installations taken together. Cedars receive the energy emanating from men through space, store it up, at the right moment give it back. They give it back when there is not enough of it in space. In other words, in man or in everything living and growing on the earth. Occasionally, though, very rarely, one discovers cedars that have been storing up energy but not giving back what they have stored. After 500 years of their life, they start to ring. This is how they talk to us, through their quiet ringing sound. This is how they signal people to take them and saw them up, to make use of their stored up energy on the earth. This is what the cedars are axing with their ringing sound. They keep on axing for three whole years. If they don't have contact with living human beings, then in three years, deprive of the opportunity to give back what they have received and stored from space, they lose their ability to give it back directly to men. Then they will start burning up with the energy internally. This torturous process of burning and dying lasts 27 years. Not long ago, we discovered a cedar like this. We determined 
that it had been raining for two years already. It was raining very softly. Perhaps it is trying to draw out its requests over a longer period of time, but still it has only one year left. It must be sought up and given away to people. The old man spoke at length, and for some reason I heard him out. The voice of the strange old cyber, cyberac, cyberac sounded at first quietly confident, then very excited, and when he got excited, he would rub the piece of cedar with his fingertip as though they were lightly tripping over some kind of musical instrument. I w it was cold on the river bank, and autumn wind was blowing across the river. Gusts of wind ruffled the hair on the old men's capless heads. But the spokesman's jacket and shirt remained unbuttoned. His fingertips kept rubbing the cedar pendant on his chest still exposed to the wind. He was still trying to explain its significant to me. Lydia Petrovna, an employer of my firm, came down the gangplank to tell me that everyone while I was already on board and awaiting for me to finish my conversation. I bade farewell to the oldsters and quickly climbed aboard. I couldn't act on their request for two reasons. Delaying departure especially for three days, would mean, in, would mean a significant financial loss. And besides, everything this, these old fellows said seemed to me at the time to be in the realm of pure superstition. The next morning, during our usual company meeting, I suddenly noticed that Lydia Petrovna was fingering a cedar pendant of her own. Later, she would tell me, that after I'd give gone abroad, she stayed behind for a while. She noticed that when I started hurrying away from them, the oldster that had been talking with, with me stared af after me with a perplexed look, and then said excitedly, excitedly to his older companion, Now how can that be? Why didn't they get it? I really don't know how to speak their language. I couldn't make them believe. I simply couldn't. Why? Tell me, father. The elder man put his hand on his son's shoulder and replied, You weren't convincing, convincing enough, son. They didn't grasp it. As I was going up the gangplank, Lydia Petrovna went on. The old man that was talking with you suddenly rushed up to me, grabbed me by the arm, and led me back down to the grass below. He hurriedly pulled out of his pocket a string. Attached to it was this piece of cedar wood. He put it around my neck and pressed it against my chest with the palm of both his hand and mine. I even felt a shiver go through my whole body. Somehow he managed to do all this very quickly and I didn't even get a chance to say anything to him. As I was walking away, he called after me, Have a safe journey. Be happy. Please come again next year. All the best people will be waiting for you. Have a safe journey. As the ship pulled away from the dock, the old fellow kept on waving at us for a long time and then all at once sat down on the grass. I was watching him through a pair of binoculars. The old man that talked with you and later gave me the pendant, I saw him sit down on the grass and his shoulders were trembling. The older one with the long beard was bending over him and stroking his head. Amidst the flurry of my subsequent commercial dealings, account keeping and end of voyage farewell banquets, I completely forgot about the strange Siberian oldsters. Upon my return to Novoskirts, I afflicted with sharp. I was afflicted with sharp pains. The diagnose. The, the diagnosis, of duodenal intestinal ulcer, an osteo. 
chondrosis of the thrust pain spine. In the quiet of the comfy hospital ward, I was cut off from the bustle of everyday life. My deluxe private room gave me an opportunity to calmly reflect, reflect on my four-month expedition and to draw up a business plan for the future. But it seemed as though my memory relegated just about everything that had happened to the background. And for some reason, the old men and what they said came to the forefront of my thought. I requested I request to have delivered to me in the hospital all sorts of literature of seat on cedars. After comparing what I read with what I had heard, I became more and more amazed and began to actually believe what the oldsters had said. There was at least some kind of truth in their words, or maybe the whole thing was true. In books on folk medicine, there is a lot said about the cedar as a healing remedy. They say that everything from the tips of the needles to the bark is endowed with highly effective healing pro properties. The Siberian cedar wood has a beautiful appearance and artistic wood carving Masters enjoy great success in using it for furniture, as well as soundboards for musical instruments. Cedar needles are highly capable of decontaminating, decontaminating the surrounding air. Cedar wood has a distinctive, pleasant, balsam fragrance. A small cedar chip placed inside a house would keep moths away. In the popular science literature, I read it was said that the qualitative characters, characteristics for the northern cedars were significantly higher than for those growing in the south. Back in 1792, the, the, uh, the Academian P.S. Pallas wrote that the fruits of the Siberian cedars were effective in restoring youth and vitality in virility and significantly increasing the body's ability to withstand a number of diseases. There is a whole host of hysterical phenomena directly or indirectly linked to the Siberian cedar. Here is one of them. In 1907, a 50-year-old semi-literature peasant named Gregory Rasputin, who held from an isolated Siberian village in an area where the Siberian cedar grows, found himself in St. Petersburg, the capital, and soon became a regular guest of the imperial family. Not only did he amaze them with his predictions, but he possessed incredible sexual stamina. At the time of his assassination, onlookers were struck by the fact that despite his bullet-ridden body, he continued to live, perhaps because he had been raised on cedar nuts in a part of the country where cedars abound. This is how a contemporary journalist described his staying power. At age 50, he could begin an orgy at noon and go on arousing until four o'clock in the morning. From his, from his fornication and drunkness, he would go directly to the church for morning prayers and stand praying until eight before heading home for a cup of tea. Then as, if, then as if nothing had happened, he would carry on receiving visitors until two in the afternoon. Next, he would collect a group of ladies and accompany them to the baths. From the baths, he would be off to a restaurant in the country where he would begin repeating the previous night's activities. No normal person could ever keep up a regime like that. The many-time world champion and Olympic champion wrestler Alexander Kerlin, who has never been defeated so far, is also a Siberian, also from an area where the Siberian cedar grows. The strong man also eats cedar nuts. A coincidence? I mention only those facts which can be easily verified in popular science literature or which could be confirmed by witnesses. Lydia Petrovna, who was 
giving the ringing, ringing cedar pendant by the Siberian Oser is now one of those witnesses. She is 36 years old, married with two children. Her co-worker have noticed changes in her behavior. She has become kinder and smiles more often. Her husband, whom I happen to know, told me that their family has now been experiencing a greater degree of mutual understanding. He also remarked that his wife was somehow become younger looking and it is starting to arouse greater feelings in him, more respect and quite possibly more love. But all these multitudinous facts and evidence pale in comparison to the main point, which you can look up for yourself, a discovery which had, has left me with not a trace of doubt. That is the Bible and the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, chapter 14, verse 4. God teaches us how to treat people and even decontaminate the um, contaminate their houses with the help of the cedar. After comparing all the facts and data I had gleaned from various sources, I was confronted by such a remarkable picture that all the miracles known to the world faded before it. The great mysteries that have excited people's minds began to pale into insignificant in comparison with the mystery of the ringing cedar. Now I could no longer have any doubts about its existence. They were all dispelled by the popular science literature and the old Vedic scriptures. I was reading, <clears throat> cedars are mentioned 42 times in the Bible, all in the Old Testament. When Moses presented humanity with the Ten Commandments on stone tablets, he probably knew more than has been recorded in the Old Testament. We are accustomed to the fact that in nature, there are various plants capable of treating human ills. The healing properties of the cedar have been attested in popular science literature by such serious and authoritative researchers at, at, as Akamedician Palace. And this is consistent with the Old Testament scriptures. And now, pay careful attention. When the Old Testament talks about the cedar, it is just the cedar alone. Nothing is said about other trees. And doesn't the Old Testament say that the cedar is the most potent medicine of any existing in nature? What is this, anyway? A medicine kit? And how is it to be used? And why out of all the Siberian cedars did these strange old fellow point to a single, single ringing cedar? But that's not all. Something immeasurably more mysterious lies behind the story from, this, from the Old Testament. Testament. King Solomon built a temple out of cedar wood. In return for the cedar from Lebanon, he gave another king, Hiram, 20 cities of his kingdom. Incredible. Giving away 20 cities, just cities, cities for just, cities just for some kind of building materials. True. He got something else in returns, in return. At King Solomon's request, he was giving servants that were skilled and, um, and felling timber. What kind of people were these? What knowledge did they possess? I have heard that even now, in the far flung reaches of the taiga, there are old people whose job is to choose trees for construction. But back then, over 2,000 years ago, everybody might have known this. Nevertheless, specialists of some sort were required. The temple was built, services, services began to be held there, and the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. What kind of cloud was that? How and from where did it enter the temple? What could it have been? Energy? A spirit? What kind of phenomenon and what connection did it have with the cedar? 
the old fellows talk about the ringing cedar at storing up some kind of energy. Which cedars are stronger, the ones in Lebanon or Siberia? Academic, academic C and Pallas said that the healing properties of the cedars increase in proportion to their proximity to the forest tundra. In that case, then the Siberian cedar would be the stronger. It says in the Bible, by three fruits, ye shall know them. In other words, again, the Siberian cedar. Could it be that no one has paid any attention to all this? Has no one put two and two together? The Old Testament, the science of the past century and the current one, are all of the same opinion regarding the cedar. And Alana and Alana Ivanovan Rorich notes in her book, Living Ethics, a chalice of cedar rests and figured in the rituals of the consecration of the kings of the ancient Khorasan. Jews also call the chalice of cedar resting in the chalice of life. And only later, with the loss of the realization of the spirit, was it replaced by the blood. The fire of Zoroaster was the result of burning of the cedar resin in the chalice. So then how much of our forebears' knowledge of the cedar, its properties and uses has been passed down to the present day? Is it possible that nothing has been preserved? What do the Siberian oysters know about it? And all at once, my memory harked back to an experience of many years ago which caused a shiver to run up and down my spine. I didn't pay any attention to it back then, but now, during the early years of, of Perestroika, I was president of the Association of the Siberian Entrepreneurs. One day I got a call from the Novberg District Executive Council. Back then we still had Communist Party committees and executive councils asking me to come to a meeting with a prominent Western businessman. He had a letter of recommendation from the government of the day. Several entrepreneurs were present, along with the workers from the, exec the executive councils, council sec executive council secretary. The Western businessman was of a rather imposing external appearance, an unusual person with oriental features. He was wearing a turban and his fingers were adorned with precious rings. The discussion as usual centered around the possibilities for cooperation in various fields. The visitor said, among other things, we would like to buy cedar nuts from you. As he spoke these words, his face and body tightened and his sharp eyes moved from side to side, no doubt studying the reaction of the entrepreneurs present. I remember the incident very well, as even then I wondered why his appearance has changed like that. After the official meeting, the Moscow interpreter, interpreter accompanying him came up to me. She said he would like to speak with me. The businessman made me a confidential proposal. If I could arrange delivery of cedar nuts for him and they had to be fresh, then I would receive a handsome personal percentage over and above the official price. The nuts were to be shipped to Turkey for processing into some kind of oil. I said I would think it over. I decided I decided I would find out for myself what kind of oils he was talking about, and I did. On the London market, which sets the standard for world prices, cedar nut oil fetches anywhere up to $500 per kilogram. Their proposed deal would have given in us approximately 2 to $3 for one kilogram of cedar nuts. I rang up an entrepreneur I happened to know in Warsaw and asked him whether it might be possible to market such a product directly to the consumer and whether we would learn the technology involved in its extraction. 
A month later, he sent me a reply. No way we weren't able to gain access to the technology. And besides, there are certain Western powers so involved in these issues of yours that it would be better just to forget about it. After that, I turned to my good friend, Const- Konstantin Ranknov, a scholar with our Novrix Consumer Cooperative Institute. I bought a shipment of nuts and finest a study. And the laboratories of these of his institute produce approximately 100 kilograms of cedar nut oil. I also hired researchers who came up with the following information from our archi- from archival documents. Before the revolution, and even for some time afterward, there was in Siberia an, organiza- an organization known as the Siberian Cooperator. People from this organization traded in oil, including cedar nut oil. They had rather swanky branch offices in Harbin, London, and New York, and rather larger Western bank accounts. After the revolution, the organization eventually collapsed, and many of its members were, went abroad. A member of the Bolshevist government, Leo, Leonid Krasin, met with the head of this organization and asked him to return to Russia. But the head of the Siberian cooperator replied that he would be of more help to Russia if he remained outside its borders. From archival materials, I further learned that cedar oil was made using wooden, only wooden press, and many villages of the Siberian, the Siberian taiga, taiga. The quality of the cedar oil depended on the season in which the nuts were gathered and how they were processed, but I was unable to determine either from the archives or the institute exactly which season was being indicated. The secret had been lost. There are no healing remedies with properties analogs to those of cedar oil, but perhaps the secret of making this oil had been passed along by one of the immigrants to someone in the West. How was it possible that the cedar nuts with the most effective healing properties grow in Siberia, and yet the faculty for producing the oil is located in Turkey? After all, Turkey has no cedars like those found in Siberia. And just what Western powers was the Wasser entrepreneur talking about? Why did he say it would be better just to forget about this issue? Might not those powers be smuggling these products with these extraordinary healing properties out of the Russian Siberian taiga? taiga? Why with such a treasure here at home with such effective properties, a treasure known for centuries, for millennia, even do we spend millions and maybe billions of dollars buying up foreign medicines and swallow them, them up like half-crazed people? How is it that we have lost the knowledge known to our forebearers, our recent forebearers yet, one who live in our century? And what about the Bible description of that extraordinary happening of over 2,000 years ago? What kind of unknown powers are trying to earnestly to erase our forebearers' knowledge from our own memories? Oh, you better stick to minding your own business. We're told, yes, they are trying to wipe it out and indeed they are succeeding. I was seized by a fit of anger. I checked and yes, cedar oil is sold in our pharmacies but it is sold in foreign packaging. I bought a single 30 gram vial and tried it. The actual oil content, I think, was no more than a couple of drops. The rest was some kind of diluting agent. Compared to what produced in the Consumer Cooperative Institute, well, there was simply no comparison. And these diluted couple of drops cost 50,000 rubles. So what if we didn't buy it abroad, but sold it ourselves? Just the sale of this oil would be enough to raise the whole of Siberia above the poverty level. 
But how did we ever manage to let go of the technology of our forebears? And here we are, sniveling that we live like paupers. Well, okay, I think I'll come up with something all the same. I'll produce the oil myself and my firm will only get wealthier. I decided I would try a second expedition along the Ob, back up north using only my headquarters ship, the Patrice Le Mumbai. I loaded a variety of goods for sale into the hold and turned the film viewing room into a store. I decided to hire a new crew and not invite anyone from my firm. As things stood, my firm's financial situation had worsened while I was distracted with my new interests. Two weeks after leaving Norverbix, my security guards reported that they had overheard conversation about the ringing cedar. And in their opinion, the newly hired workers included some pretty strange people, to put it mildly. I began summoning individual crew members to my quarters to talk about the forthcoming trek into the Tega. Some of them even agreed to go on a volunteer basis. Others asked for extra pay for this operation, said it was not something they had agreed for when signing up for work. It was one thing to stay in the comfortable condition aboard ship, quite another to trek 25 kilometers into the taiga and back, carrying loads of wood. My finances at the time were already pretty tight. I had not planned on selling the cedar. After all, the oldsters had said it should be given away. Besides, my main interest was not the cedar tree itself, but the secret of how to extract the oil. And of course, it would be fascinating to find out all the details connected with it. Little by little, with the help of my security guards, I realized that there would be attempts made to spy on my movements, especially during any time I spent ashore. But for that, for what purpose was unclear? And who was behind the would-be spies? I thought and thought about it and decided that to be absolutely certain, I would somehow have to outsmart everyone at once.